I am a, the chapter leader for Connecticut Insulin for All, and I've been living with diabetes for almost 15 years. I, my divestment work basically comes from my full-time job, which is uh, working with religious sisters on justice movements and also working at their UN NGO in New York City. So I've been able to learn from a really great uh, cohort and I learn something new every day. So I'm really excited to present to you about divestment campaigns. And I'm gonna come from an advocate standpoint, not from an econom economist viewpoint on this. So bear with me, I think everyone will be able to get this. Um, I've broken it down and it's more about how are, you can take some action items with a lot of this really great information we've been presented. So kind of the grounding topic to this conversation is, questions we can all ask ourselves and should ask ourselves. As a consumer and as an activist, where do you spend your money? Where do you invest your time? And where do you invest your energy? And as an activist and a disabled activist, I'm constantly considering where I put my resources. We all have a finite amount of resources. And for me, this is why I was drawn to T1 International and the Insulin for All chapters. Initially, I wanted an organization that aligned with my values. And so I think it's important for each of us to think, why are we here? Why do we volunteer with T1 International? And why are we interested in the mission? And I think these questions are really great to ask ourselves, but we can start applying this to others. We can apply it to groups of people, to influencers, celebrities, colleges, universities, politicians, and even investors. And what if we held them to the same standards that we hold ourselves to? So let's get into what divestment actually is. And for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to define divestment as the withdrawal of investments or refusal to invest in companies or products that are deemed unethical. So that's a pretty broad term, and that's going to differ person to person, and it's also going to differ company to company. And that could mean the divestment of stocks, bonds, and other investments, but I also like to think of it as resources and time as well. Divestment is really one of many tools that activists have in their toolbox. We have protests, uh, we have civil disobedience, which you'll hear a little bit tomorrow uh, with Fran Quigley. And then there's also boycotts, which for obvious reasons, people with diabetes cannot do. Uh, we live and die by insulin and it is so important that we acknowledge that as we move forward. And there's a large intersection between these different tools. So just to keep that in mind. What are effective divestment campaigns? So I've highlighted some of the sort of like top things I've seen in different divestment campaigns. And we'll talk about some specifics later. The first thing is really creating stigmatization of the offending company or industry. And the way that you kind of, you've seen it happen is that people are deemed as sort of pariahs. And that is through effective media exposure and sharing stories like we do so well. And an effective and successful campaign, you know, when you hear divestment, you think, okay, their stocks have to lower, there has to be a lower bottom line. But to be effective, it doesn't require that. There may be no impact on share prices, or you can have bad actors come in and snatch up these low stocks. But we, you know, we have to acknowledge that people need these medications and will continue, these companies have to continue receiving funds. Um, there's just no way around it. Even in the universal healthcare system, these companies will continue to have profits. Uh, but you can make it seem immoral to do business with them or until change is achieved, essentially. Uh, one thing that we do continuously well is utilize media exposure. Uh, we've seen it in just the thousands of insulin for all articles that are run pretty much every year for the last couple of years now. And then wherever possible, effective divestment campaigns are a part of a bigger piece of the puzzle. So you bundle it with campaigns that have other direct effects, like I, I think of this fossil fuel energy boycotts, or you can have specific policy changes, which is something we are also already advocating for. And then the big major thing that I think we always need to keep in mind is what are the solutions? So where do we reinvest our money? 
I think it's always important that we think about what communities are most directly impacted by the mountainous um, amounts of profit that these companies are making that Rosie talked about earlier. And how do we reinvest the money into these communities? I want to talk a little bit about divestment versus responsible investment. They share a lot of similarities, but there are two different approaches. And just to go over that responsible investment is the practice of investing in socially conscious companies or using shareholder votes or resolutions to encourage better practices. Now, what is considered a socially conscious really depends again on the person and company. And then the shareholder resolutions, just for a little bit of an explanation, are when investors raise environmental, social, um, corporate issues of concern. And again, you'll see the similarities. They use um, PR and education to the public, and they're a way to garner attention, uh, attention from com company executives. Now, when people and businesses are looking at responsible investing in companies, there's something called negative screens. And so negative screens for an investor is something that they refute, they will have no part in. So responsible investing is hoping to create change. But for a lot of organizations, again, it looks very different. But there's usually a commonality. So tobacco, alcohol, arms, and weapons manufacturers are kind of considered the big three in terms of negative screens. What is really interesting about the negative screens, though, is that they're risky investments due to public opinion and politics around them. And they're generally due to successful divestment campaigns. And I left some questions about, you know, what do people consider when they're considering divesting versus investing? And some of it is how long have you been at the table? Are people listening when you're speaking? And if you're an already an investor, would they notice if you left the table? So is it better to be a fly on the wall and have this information and feed it to others? Or would it create more attention um, to leave. And I think it can be a both and approach to activism. So I'm gonna go over three campaigns that have made or are currently making a difference. There are plenty of more examples out there and I encourage you if this is something interesting to do research on them. And additionally, this is really short overviews of the different campaigns. There's a lot of people and movements involved in making these campaigns successful. And I don't wanna gloss over that uh, I can't talk about all of them. And just really honoring the historical movements of the past who have really brought us here. And we have so much to learn from uh, Black communities, Latinx communities, communities of color, Indigenous folks, LGBTQ folks who have been doing the orga organizing around these issues for so long. So the first one is the South African apartheid, which was a political and social system in South Africa that enforced racial discrimination against non-whites from 1948 until about the early 1900s. And negotiations took even four years to reach you know, the political end of apartheid. Um, just acknowledging that these campaigns do take time. You'll see uh, that there are so many different critical parts to this. And in 1962, the UN passed a resolution to create economic sanctions uh, against South Africa for apartheid. And then all Western reject nations rejected that and then boycotted the entire committee together. It took another decade with something called the Sullivan Principles, which was a Black-led movement that essentially made it impossible for a lot of organizations to even do business in South Africa or produce parts. One of the commonalities you'll see through the three different campaigns we're going to talk about is that colleges and universities have been so critical to garnering attention. They've done everything from organized sit-ins, uh, which you can see in this photo is from Smith College. Um, I love it. Totally blocking the doors, making sure that classes were interrupted. Uh, boycotts, uh, some built shanty towns on campuses to just bring national attention to what was happening. And the first school to agree to divest their entire um, portfolio was Hampshire College in Massachusetts. But with that one, by 1988, a total of 155 colleges had at least partially divested from South Africa. Uh, one of the uh, fun facts I love 
throwing out there is that President Barack Obama's first act of political activism was actually at Occidental College organizing div divestment campaigns around apartheid. So eventually automotive and computer companies came along and they refused to do business in South Africa as well. And because in part of these divestment campaigns, the US Congress actually overrode President Reagan's veto of the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act of 1986 and successfully passed economic sanctions against the country. And a lot of people believe that that was kind of the beginning of the end of apartheid. But as you can see, this took decades and decades of work to reach there. Uh, it took a lot of organizers to get to that point. And you can see similar campaigns uh, that have taken place in Sudan and the human rights violations occurring in Darfur and also in Syria and Iran. The next one is private prisons and is a little bit more personal for me because the group that I work for, uh, the U.S. Federation of the Sisters of St. Joseph, them and um, the many religious sisters that they work with were one of the primary organizations responsible for the withdrawal of Chase Bank from private prisons in 2019. Uh, that's all to say that this was also the lead in for decades of activism, um, raising issues, investigations and lawsuits happening in these private prisons. And at the time before Chase had divested, they held 9% of US prison population, but three quarters of immigrant detainees. And because of that particular issue, um, that is eventually how they were able to get Chase to divest. And then because of their divestment, five other banks followed. And as you can see, 72% of all current financing was represented by those six companies. That's a huge portion. Uh, some of the major players in this divestment campaign, which obviously continues today, again, universities and colleges, teachers and public pensions, uh, religious and faith communities and foundations have all been really core to that and have taken divestment efforts in their own lives. So you can see there's a lot of different organizations and ways to educate and divest. Uh, state legislators have also followed the lead, including working to pass legislation that would prohibit banks from financing private prisons. Uh, I just want to call attention to, again, some of the university and students that are working on this issue right now. So in 2019, John Hopkins students staged a month long sit in and that was to cancel. They were trying to build a private police force on their campus and also so that John Hopkins would end their contracts with ICE. Additionally, Harvard prison divestment campaigns, they have a just reinvestment fund. So instead of having their alum donate to Harvard, they are using those funds and redistributing them to communities that are most impacted by the prison industrial complex. I think the one that most of us will probably be pretty similar to because this is uh, very much a now issue and something that has garnered a lot of attention, at least this is what kind of like first put on my radar was fossil fuels. And I, there are so many people working on this and you know, tons of celebrities that are working on this issue and talking about this issue. Uh, but again, colleges and universities, I think college, we have a lot to learn from college students and their tenacity. And so Swarthmore, Swarthmore College essentially kicked off the nationwide movement. Uh, universities and other organizations had been working in silos up until that point. And so after a portion of those students went to Appalachia, and saw mountaintop removal mining. And that was kind of what led them to start this divestment campaign. And so it kind of interconnected colleges and universities across the US. And I, high school students are also getting involved and they're using social media, sort of similar to how our Insulin for All campaign started. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to make this work. In 2019, at the Yale Harvard game, which happened just down the road from where I actually live, um, I was actually in New Haven when this happened. It was uh, pretty exciting news. So, divestment protesters from both Yale and Harvard swarmed the field uh, during halftime and refused to leave. And they just staged a sit in for hours 
and they were chanting, disclose, divest, or this will be our death. And that went on for a long time and really brought a lot of attention to what was going on at the schools. Um, even in 2020, there's divestment day. And there was, there was all these sit-ins and walkouts and banner drops. But also in addition to that is really looking about the communities that are most deeply impacted by the harm. So they really looked at the indigenous communities and drawing attention to what's going on there. So we, we have an idea of what divestment actually is and some of the ways that different communities have engaged on the issue. But we need to talk a little bit about who do we actually divest from. And Rosie did a great job talking about the insulin manufacturers and how they are benefiting from the insulin prices, um, as well as the PBMs and the insurers. We know it's a complex system that there's many people that are a part of this. So insulin manufacturers, of course, but who else? So PBMs, who are kind of the middlemen, we look at insurers, but also the executives and shareholders of all of these different circles that I have listed there and how much money they are making by sitting on these boards, by sitting on as executives. Uh, we look at politicians. We know that politicians are making a ton of money um, in terms of campaign finances and what they're receiving. I have another slide right after this uh, to highlight just how much money they're making yearly. We know diabetes companies and organizations are receiving a lot of money from the above aforementioned uh, industries. And so they are also, we have noticed, especially when we talk about, say, the copay caps or about other legislative changes, because of that money, we have heard a lot of silence in terms of the deaths of people from rationing um, and not even just the deaths, the, the total impact it has on people. And then colleges and universities. Colleges and universities receive a lot of money, whether it's from grants for, you know, admittedly important research, but also there's endowments. So Lilly has something called Lilly Endowment and they give out grants to communities to, you know, organizations that really deserve stuff, but also it could go to things like building part of the school um, and university. And when we look at Eli Lilly's shares, I think it's interesting that institutions own roughly 70% of those shares, while only 17% is public ownership. And I also, I, I don't think the chat function's open, but we could talk about this a little bit more, but like, are there any others you can think to add to the list? These were like the six main ones I could think of. There are plenty more. And this is just a slide to highlight how much money people are making both from Eli Lilly and Santa Fe. Um, you can find this on opensecrets.org at any time. It's always a fascinating experience to go on there. And you can also see this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, the names at the top are all pretty popular names uh, regardless of their political affiliation. So definitely a bipartisan issue moving forward. So how can we incorporate this into our activism? I always look at, like to be a little solution oriented. So at the beginning of this, I asked you, where do you invest your money? Where do you invest your time? And where do you invest your energy? Um, probably not a lot of time to think about it, but I hope, you know, maybe after a week from now, you can kind of think about that. Now, we can ask ourselves this question, and I think this can dictate how we spend our time and our days. But I think we can and we should be asking these same questions of celebrities, influencers, politicians, companies that are benefiting from the sale of our lifeblood. You know, who is benefiting from this insulin prices? Who is benefiting from the big three? Who are shareholders in the big three? Have they shown they've been able to negotiate or listen to the concerns of shareholders or advocates? I have my personal feelings on that, but you know, it's important to ask ourselves, are people listening? And I hope this presentation can leave you with some ideas or get the cogs turning about where we can move our activism collectively in the future. And then finally, I have this fourth question here that I didn't ask in the beginning, but this is a really important question. 
And, you know, moving forward, where are we going to ask people to reinvest their money? Because we've already made gigantic strides in the stigmatization and in the media and PR circle. I think we can make huge strides in divestment. So let's plan for a future where we hold these companies accountable for our lives and hopefully start holding all pharmaceutical companies to these same standards. I also have my email. You can always find me at the Connecticut Insulin for All chapter. I'm always there, um, but also my personal email if you have any questions.